I'm going to be talking in English. Uh, como Adrián, si quieren que presente en español, me invitan la próxima vez. Él presenta en inglés y en español. Uh, but today I'm going to be presenting in English. And um, I want to continue building on what we've heard this morning. Talk about celebrating creativity and storytellers. Creativity and storytellers have been around since the beginning of time. When we create, it's a gift. It's a gift from God, who was the first one, because in the beginning, he created. And so he created us to create as well, to tell stories. And storytelling is how we connect, how we build community. And I'm going to be sharing to you how we have filmmakers that are telling those visual stories that are creating modern-day parables. So throughout history of humanity, storytelling has been a way has played a critical role in the way that we pass down uh, culture, traditions, in which we share our history, and also in the way that we shape our values and our beliefs. Storytelling is a fundamental part of being human. Stories let us share information that creates an emotional connection. We make sense of our life and experiences by the stories that we tell and that we learn. Stories have the ability to help us learn about one another, to find understanding and empathy for them, those that we don't know, for their situations, whether we actually know the individual or not. Hearing their story evokes feelings in us and creates a connection. And that's why we're here, right? Because we follow the example of a storyteller that used, in his time, the cutting-edge tool. Today, it's cinema, filmmaking. Some have said it's the literature of the 21st century. Well, Jesus told parables, which in his time was a way in which he could deal with complex social and spiritual issues, but help people through story form understand them in a more simple way. Parables allows us, allow us to connect with audiences that we'd otherwise miss. And the cinema today, what other medium is there where you could potentially, unless you're watching it at home, have someone's undivided attention on a big screen. When we showed videos here this morning and shared video clips, it's very difficult to look away. You're focused, you're listening to that story. And that's what we have uh, at Sunscreen. We work with young creatives, young filmmakers who are trying to find ways to tell those modern day parables in a medium where they can hold people's attention in a medium where their uh, fellow young people, where other people that we're not connecting with are. It's a medium that we have not yet used effectively, but should and could use effectively. So I want to share with you my presentation in a way. Do you have a family member or a friend that always wants to show you clips on YouTube and say, hey, watch, you got to watch this, watch this? You have, sometimes it's your spouse when you're trying to get stuff done at home and, hey, you got to show you this video. Well, that's kind of what like, my, my presentation is going to be like. So I'm going to show you a bunch of different things. But I wanted to show some mainstream um, fictional characters that you may not have thought as potential parables. So, Man of Steel, Superman, right? Any, any Superman fans? If not, you don't have to raise your hand if it's not OK. <laughs> but uh, I know several. So uh, this is, I'm going to talk about Zack Snyder's uh, Man of Steel. But there's a couple interesting things in the story, and, and those of you that, follow, that know Superman will know this. So it's someone who comes, a higher life form, that comes to save humanity, right? That's kind of the basic gist of Superman. So in this storyline, he has to sacrifice his life to save the world. If you watch Zack Snyder's Superman, he's 33 years old, and they mention that in the movie when he realizes what his purpose is, when his father, from who, has, who communicates to him through the, through the Crystal Palace, tells him what his purpose is, and it is to save humanity, 33 years old. And if you watch all the way to Justice League, he does die in Man of Steel, but he is resurrected. He comes back to life. There's a lot of visual imagery. For those of you who've seen the movie, when he dies, he is in a cross form. Um, so where does that come from? Uh, was it Zack Snyder? He said he, lay, he leaned into the original story. Well, we'll go back to the comic book. 
don't know if there's any comic book fans, but if you look at the origin of Superman, so it was created by Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, who were Jewish immigrants that came to the United States, escaping persecution and trouble. And they did want to create a, a character that was like Moses. That was their intention from their tradition. So Superman's name, original name, is Kal-El, which, and I'm not a linguist, but I, I looked it up, and uh, El is, uh, some, is, can be God, part of God. And so if you put together Kal-El, it's God of light, which could refer to bright light, or also light, as in a weight, not heavy, as in because he can fly, but also power. So definitely they were using their, uh, their tradition, their culture, and their religious culture to influence who they wanted this character to be. Also, don't know if you know this, but Clark Kent, that is Superman's name when he's not Superman, his middle initial is J. Let's see if there's any heart. Anybody know what that J stands for? It's Joseph. Joseph. So it's Clark Joseph Kent. Why Joseph? Well, is he named after his parents? So if you know, his parents are Jonathan and Martha Kent. But something I did not realize till I looked into this, when they started the comic books, their names were Joseph and Mary. So he was named, his middle name is after his father, Clark Joseph Kent. So initially, when they started Superman, his parents' name were Joseph and Mary. So you start to see this all come together, right? Could Superman be used for certain audiences as a way, as a parable where you can begin conversations about who Jesus is, why he came, in a way in which they could more easily understand it? So now I want to share with you another movie that made a deep impact on me when I was 11 years old and went to see this. Uh, not with my parents. I was at my cousin's house. He was allowed to go to the movies back then. But E.T. the Extraterrestrial, anybody familiar with this movie? Okay, do you know, now, do, now thinking about it, do you see, is there a parable there? Is there an analogy? Let's find out. So E.T. is a botanist, he's a scientist that comes from another planet to study the plants and trees on Earth. And he accidentally gets left behind because there's humans, there's soldiers, military men that are persecuting them, that found out, find out they're here and chase them. So they have to leave in a hurry. They leave E.T. behind. He's scared, confused. He befriends Elliot. Elliot is the boy in red, who is a boy whose parents have divorced. He's lonely. He's sad going through that. So they find each other, and it takes some time, but Elliot helps hide E.T. and helps him get through. So at some point, because E.T. is here on Earth longer than, than he should be, he gets sick. But what's interesting, and, and he is captured by, by the soldiers, but Elliot and E.T., because of their connection, are connected to each other. So e. T., they're both dying. They're both dying. But then E.T. does something. The boys start to separate. E.T. dies so that Elliot can live. A little boy, and he does live. And what's interesting, the imagery, uh, if, you know, the story of Jesus during the crucifixion, there were, it, it was dark, right? There was a lot of things happening in the atmosphere around while he was dying. So even some of the imagery in the movie, the plants begin to die when E.T. dies. But then what happened to E.T.? So I'm going to show you a clip, and so I'm going to ask you not to, not to take pictures or videotape. This is for educational purposes only. But I want to show you a, a short clip from the movie um, so we can see this is, so E.T. has died, and, and as we start, the imagery, E.T. is in a sort of tomb, in a coffin. Because I don't 
know how to feel. They can't feel anything anymore. You've gone someplace else now. I don't believe in you all my life. Every day. Phone home. Home. Phone home. Phone home. Does this mean they're coming? Yes. <laughs> E.P. Phone home. E.P. Phone home. E.P. Phone home. Phone home. Phone home. Phone home. Phone home. home. Oh no, it is on home, 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 it is on Elliot, why don't you come with me? No! 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 It's all right. No! It's all right. Would you like the flowers? No! So all the way to him when he's jumping, saying he's alive, he's alive. And it's interesting, as the camera pulls back, he shows his hands and he points at his hands, Elliot. So there's a lot of imagery there in the movie. And then there's also final scene when E.T. leaves, an ascension scene where he goes back up and they all look at him as he leaves. So it gives a lot of opportunity to talk. And I remember even as a kid, you know, telling my parents, I confessed after I went to see the movie and talked about it, but talking to them and saying, there's something that seemed like the resurrection to me, the story of Jesus coming back. So again, parables allow us to talk about some of these issues that people may not be interested or think they're not interested in, but make them more accessible to them. And films can be parables too. So really quick, I'm going to take you through the history. In North America, in 1929, the Voice of Prophecy was the first Christian radio program to be broadcast across the country. So we were at the cutting edge of using storytelling and technology together. In 1950, Faith for Today was the first Christian television program to be broadcast across the United States. And again, we were at the forefront. In 1970, we used narrative drama. There was a series called Westbrook Hospital about doctors and their patients. And uh, this was broadcast on television across the United States. So we were using drama, narrative drama, to begin to connect with new audiences. And then we go to 2012, The Record Keeper. Anybody familiar with The Record Keeper? But again, using narrative drama and now bridging over to the parable to find a way to make the great controversy more accessible to broad audiences. But really, much more than that, narrative drama and the modern day parable has not been utilized uh, that much. So in 2002, back up 10 years before the record keeper, Jerry Wallach 
this gentleman worked for the North American division. He said, we need to find a place where young creatives and young filmmakers can come together and feel safe to create, to share their stories. And Stacia Doolin was the first director of the Sunscreen Film Festival, the first executive director. And it grew over time. So 10 years later, there was a big, a larger community. It was students, college students. We're very fortunate that our uh, colleges and universities, most of them have film programs in North America. So they would come together, together with young filmmakers that were already professionals working together, and they would share, they would network, they would share their films and find ways to grow creatively. So 2023, this is last year's film festival. We now meet in Loma Linda, California. We have over 250 uh, filmmakers that come to the festival. Uh, we screen their movies. Uh, it's just an opportunity for them to come together, to feel like community, a safe environment where they can create uh, free of the criticism sometimes that the well-intentioned can lead young creatives not to want to continue uh, their trade. Um, they have the ability to talk about their films. They share with us what did they mean? Why were they trying to say, what were they trying to say in their films? Uh, we have a pitch competition where three students are selected to pitch to a professional panel and uh, the winners get some much needed money, not a lot, but a little bit, to create their next work. Uh, and uh, yeah, as for those of you that are creatives and want to do that, sometimes it just comes down to having the money to do that. Uh, we have guest speakers. So last year we had um, John Quinn, who is the editor of a TV series, I don't know if you're familiar with The Chosen. So <laughs> I, I think most of you are. So we had a very packed house. We had a lot of community members that came in. Uh, William Scosta was there. He was there for the whole festival. So appreciate the support. And so he was there when John Quinn uh, shared with us. In the past, um, we've had Bill Mechanic. Bill Mechanic was the lead producer of a movie called Hacksaw Ridge, story of Desmond Doss. But what some of you may not know is that Bill was also the former CEO and president of 20th Century Fox Films. So if you've heard of films like Titanic, Braveheart, Fight Club, those were all produced while he was uh, chairman of 20th Century Fox. So we, they're able to talk about their experiences and share and connect with the students. Uh, it's just a community where um, we celebrate their creativity. Uh, we have students from Oakwood University. These are some of the schools uh, that are there. Walla Walla University, Pacific Union College, um, and just come together because Aside from the work that they're doing to try to reach out with these modern day parables, some of these creatives, some of these kids, uh, this is their only contact with the church for many of them, uh, this festival. So we feel that responsibility uh, to come. And sunscreen, um, we've talked about you know, the frame, the picture frame. It has boundaries. There are boundaries uh, for these creatives. But within those boundaries, uh, the texture, the colors that they use, the type of paints, the subject matter, the stories they want to tell, that's up to them because we basically want to teach them how to tell stories, not what stories to tell. How to create, not what to create. And most importantly, how to think creatively, not what to think creatively. So, in their own words, I want to share with you really quick um, what they think of sunscreen. Attending Sunscreen was my very first film festival, and I absolutely loved it. This year, Oakwood University attended Sunscreen Film Festival for the very first time, and as an NAD school, oh, did the team make us feel welcome. 
they were extremely intentional about making sure that we felt at home, that connections were made, relationships were established, students had a chance to interact. And that is extremely important as we step out into the industry as creators that believe in obtaining and sustaining our morals, our values, and our ethics. Sunscreen is special within the Adventist Church. There's a unique community happening between young filmmakers and professional filmmakers where they're seeing how it is possible to be a believer in Jesus Christ and a member of this Adventist Church and also do work at the most aspirational level professionally of what any filmmaker is doing anywhere on the planet. That might be hard for some people to see without something like sunscreen in place. I think sunscreen allows us to step into a space where we know we fit, we know we belong, but we can also reach for those dreams that God's placed in our heart. When I started moving towards film as a career, I had no mentors. And so finding people that could support me, that could be good community for me, was essential, not just for my growth as a filmmaker, but my survival as a Christian working in the arts. Probably my favorite thing about taking our students to sunscreen is the networking opportunities. And this is for students and professors. Filmmaking is a huge collaborative sort of endeavor. And the more people you can know who are interested in the kind of filmmaking that you are, the better. One of the nice things about sunscreen is being able to have those conversations with other students about what their whole creative process is. Going to sunscreen, I was able to network with a lot of people within the conference, people within just the film world that I had never thought that I would ever have a chance to meet. The competition helps students be able to connect their ideas, make it reality, and also talk to professionals about their idea so when they leave, they can take their projects and learn how to pitch to someone in front of them. In our program, the students have to find the budgets themselves for their short films. And so it's a huge benefit to our students that Sunscreen has now started doing this pitch competition over the last years because students are able to pitch an idea that they have and then get those funds before they make the film. And so their overall film is much higher in quality and will help them get future jobs better. Sunscreen is a fantastic annual film festival, and it's even more than that. We partner with our Adventist universities and with a global network of church divisions to create content for outreach and education. The Trans-European Division and the Inter-European Division spearhead a collaborative project every year. And in past years, we've worked with Walla Walla University on Arnian, a creative revelation web series, and with La Sierra, Hawaiian Mission Academy, and Southern on projects with the theme of uncertainty. This year, I had the opportunity to write and direct Those Were the Good Days, a short film for the Happiness Network project in collaboration with Pacific Union College. Projects like that wouldn't have existed if it wasn't for grant money from Julio and Sunscreen support for projects of a similar ethos and mindset. The U3 project has actually led to jobs and internships really directly. Because of that project, I actually have students who were able to do internships, people who were able to get paid for their work professionally. And it was really meaningful for me to be able to reflect on some of my own experiences and grow because of what that documentary project pushed me to think about. Sunscreen Film Festival is